There is a yearning, there is a hunger in the society which we sense deeply for some place that I can be real, for some place that I can just be myself, that I'm okay the way I am, that I don't have to change, that I don't have to do anything. Now that we're in the digital age, all bets are off about what's going to happen with stress because we've introduced entirely new levels of stress into our lives. The stress of information processing and the speed at which things are going. While you may not be able to change all the outside pressures and forces in your life, how you actually work with them and respond to them, you do have a huge amount to say over. Uh, but you have to be in touch with what's going on in your life, otherwise they'll just kill you or bowl you over. It's not the stress so much, but how you handle it within limits that is what really makes the difference. Uh, now that we live in uh, a kind of very complex society, the stresses tend to be somewhat different. The stress of whether you can make a living or the stress of uh, getting your kids through high school or the stress of uh, mm, feeling like your job is being uh, downsized or you're no longer happy in your work or, or you are having a hard time in your relationships with people. Those things can be very, very stressful in some sense or other stress is in the eye of the beholder. What's stressful to one person is not stressful to somebody else. So somebody might deal with pressure at work extremely well and in fact only thrive under periods of pressure at work, whereas somebody else just goes to pieces under that same kind of pressure. Now there's more and more of a fuzzy boundary between work life and home life because uh, your electronics uh, goes with you home and between the work week and the weekend and between night and day so that if you're not careful you could be working virtually all the time on your cell phone all the time or faxes or email or this or that to the point where you're always reacting or responding to something else and you have no time to actually be so always doing so one of the key dimensions of uh, stress reduction and of the work of mindfulness is to actually recapture the being in human being so that we don't, as the cliche goes, become entirely fantastic human doings and in the process stress ourselves out enormously. But we're also isolated sometimes within ourselves. We're isolated from our bodies. We're isolated from uh, uh, good feelings within ourselves that sometimes we feel like we're just driving on empty, that we're just on a treadmill and running and running and running. And sometimes like when we stop, just like not even knowing what to do because we're so used to and virtually so addicted to doing and to activity. Another feature of our society at this point in time is that a lot of the traditional uh, structures that buffered us from uh, the stresses of living are no longer quite so robust. So the family is under huge levels of stress that it didn't used to experience, uh, in part because we're so mobile. So uh, one generation may be scattered all over the country, the other generation is home. Uh, we don't tend to live where we grew up. So we don't have the supports of an extended family. Uh, very often the same thing with uh, church or with religion. The church used to in some way create a kind of community and a buffer and a holding environment for us to feel like we knew who we were and we knew where we were going. That also is not really uh, serving in the way that it used to in previous generations. So that's why we set up the stress reduction clinic at the UMass Medical Center 20 years ago now in 1979 to catch people who were really feeling uh, the effects of stress in their lives uh, 
often to the point where it has manifested in the form of frank diseases of one kind or another or chronic pain conditions or whatever, which just compounds the stress in your life, and uh, give them an opportunity in an environment for learning how to mobilize what we call our deep inner resources for learning, growing, and healing virtually across the lifespan, that we all have these deep inner capacities for healing, but we don't have the traditional structures for helping us to get there anymore. So in a sense, we have to develop them for ourselves. Stress Reduction Clinic, Leslie speaking. Hello. The beauty of a clinic that teaches you stress reduction is that it teaches you adaptive ways to uh, deal with the stress in your life. And the first one is to notice it, to actually recognize the degree to which you're under stress and the various kinds of things that do cause us stress, and then learn effective ways of handling the stress, of coping with the stress, of dropping into deep states of relaxation and well-being from which you see differently. What we found over the past 20 years is that even though there was plenty of business for the stress reduction clinic uh, in 1979, now the levels of stress that people are crawling into the clinic with sometimes are just unbelievable because of the digital age and the speed up of time and everything else and all sorts of complex reasons. We see a vast range of people with medical disorders in our clinic ranging from hypertension, all sorts of coronary, heart disease, uh, chronic pain conditions, a range of different kinds of cancers, uh, uh, anxiety and all of the associated physical disorders related to anxiety and panic. I think the irony is that we have a hell of a lot more technology, but we have less time than ever for ourselves. And Thoreau would have really bemoaned that. And I think that some of his message is really integrated into the stress reduction clinic and the work that we do with people. And it's in some ways uh, the message of mindfulness. Walden is really a rhapsody about mindfulness. It's all about the value of the present moment. and. Uh, the beauty of living in the present moment. He, he called it the bloom of the present moment and spoke about sitting in his doorway all day watching the sun move across the sky and listening to the birds and to uh, feeling the wind on his, on his face as it whistled through the trees. I'm sure you're all aware that there are very, very salient limits to what medicine can do. And so part of this work is, as you know, to uh, participate in our own well-being and in our own health and in our own journey uh, of uh, learning and growing and, and healing uh, literally across the lifespan and to engage in our lives as if it was really worth it and to not uh, shy away from emotions that are scary or periods of darkness where we don't have a sense of where we're going and that we learn to step in and embrace the whole of that. I was taking so much medication uh, and I couldn't just, I couldn't cope with the stress of um, a busy life that um, our family lives uh, and I, I just was hardly functioning with my with my kids and uh, I was just beside myself with pain. And so the heart of stress reduction really comes down to reorienting yourself to know who it is that you are and be present for your life as it's actually unfolding. That's the door into health. That's the secret of mind-body health and mind-body well-being, is to integrate your life through being present for it. It's like the present moment is often a hidden dimension in our life. Of course we're present, we're here and all of that, but if you start checking your mind, a lot of the time we're not. And we are alienated from the body, so as I think it was James Joyce who in Dubliners said at a certain point, uh, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And I think a lot of us live for decades a short distance from our bodies. That started me thinking about 
increasingly the amount of ways that I've uh, moved away from myself and gotten almost wired to the outside, you know, with the cell phone or the faxes and increasing demands in, in my job and um, family. I like to make a distinction between healing because most people come wanting a cure but it's very impractical. You haven't had the cure through cardiology, you haven't had the cure through surgery, you haven't had the cure through oncology, but you expect it to come in stress reduction? Forget about it, you know? A cure is not what, most of medicine cannot supply cures for most of the things that people have, but healing is something that's virtually always possible, even if you're a, a day away from dying or a half hour away from dying. I define healing as coming to terms with the actuality of your situation. So it's related to a kind of relax, relaxing into what is, what is happening. You don't have to like it, it's just that way. Thoreau came to Walden in part to try to find a, a truer and a simpler way to live by cultivating awareness of the inner landscape as well as the outer landscape. And uh, he would, you know, watch the leaves uh, turn color in the fall and fall on the ground and listen to the pond freeze over and then watch it thaw in the spring. He said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I hadn't lived. And I think that that is really a huge challenge for all of us. There are many ways in which the world is multidimensional, but we don't know it. So there are dimensions of our lives that are actually hidden to us because we aren't paying attention, we, don't take, we take them for granted, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, I discovered at one point, uh, because someone showed it to me, that there were hidden dimensions of symmetry in a banana, something I was very unaware of. Some of you may know this, but maybe some of you don't. And um, the way you observe this, and I've, I've known bananas my whole life, but never thought to do the following, uh, to actually put pressure on the tip of the banana and watch. Now, if I then open it up like this, gently so the thing doesn't fall apart, which it is at risk for doing, it turns out that a banana has three equal parts to it that are folded together. Did you know that? It has three-fold symmetry. We've been eating bananas all our life, but we just like didn't realize that there was this dimensionality to it. But if you folded them back together, you'd actually have a banana. I, and very sticky hands, by the way. <laughs> but the point is that there are many dimensions of our lives that are really folded up. They're not unfurled. One of them, a great deal of the time, as you know, is the present moment. To cultivate mindfulness, we begin to pay attention or direct our attention to things that usually we never, never pay any attention to at all, that we take totally for granted. One is like the fact that you have a body. Most of the time we don't even think about that unless it breaks down, it's like body, you know, it's like, uh, uh, if it does break down, then it feels like a huge burden, and what am I gonna do with this body? Or my body has betrayed me, I have cancer, my cells are growing out of control, my heart doesn't work anymore. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which one can feel betrayed by the body. Our challenge to our patients is this. We say, look, from our point of view, as long as you're breathing, there's more right with you than wrong with you, no matter what's wrong with you. And we're gonna focus in, on the st in the stress reduction clinic, we're gonna focus in on what's right with you. And let the whole rest of the hospital and medical center and doctors and staff and everything take care of what the medical problems are, but we're gonna pour energy into these unapparent dimensions that you may not even be aware of by cultivating mindfulness and see if your life doesn't in some way respond to this and your body and your health problems as well.
So we start by paying attention. And I like to quip, well, to what's right under our noses. Well, the first thing that's right under our noses is the fact that we're breathing. Unless you're choking on a piece of food or something like that, the breath never seems to be that interesting. And if I asked you to pay attention to it for five or 10 minutes, after a few seconds, you'd probably go, oh my God, I mean, this is so boring. Couldn't I have something more interesting to look at or do or think about? Uh, because the mind doesn't want to attend to anything for very long. On the other hand, if you were choking on a piece of food or drowning, all of your ideas about the future and your success at work and the well-being of this and that and everything else would instantly fall away. And the only thing you would be interested in was getting that next breath in because your life depends on it. So there's something to be said for not taking the breath for granted while it's flowing easily. And actually what meditators come to learn is that the breath is an incredible ally in the process of healing, in the process of growing, in the, process, in the adventure of your life. You might close your eyes, but that's not even necessary. If you don't want to close your eyes, you just leave your eyes uh, unfocused in front of you. And gradually let your attention alight on the breath as if it were a leaf gently fluttering down on the surface of a pond. And then allowing the attention to just ride on the waves of the breath in the same way that the leaf would ride on the waves of the pond. And you just feel the breath moving in your body. As I do it now, I can feel the air moving in and out past the nostrils. And I can also feel my belly, which is expanding a little on each in-breath and receding a little on each out-breath, almost as if there were a balloon in the belly. And it just expands a bit. And I'm not forcing this, in fact, I'm not doing it. It's just happening all by itself as the breath moves in and out. You wanna bring uh, your rear end up off the floor and then if possible, let your knees come down on the floor so that you're sitting in a posture that embodies dignity. But there's no reason to sit on the floor in particular, and uh, very often, you know, I will sit in the chair. The feet flat on the floor and the spine coming out of the pelvis away from the back of the chair, unless you really need the support of the back of the chair, so that you're in a balanced, dignified posture. I tend to follow my breath down in the belly and giving ourselves over to it. Actually, as if our life depended on it, falling into wakefulness, just being present with no agenda whatsoever other than to simply be here and attend to the breath flowing. The whole notion that meditation was a big mystery, you know, like you had to climb to the top of a mountain and go, um, and, you know, cross your legs a certain way, and it was all really sacred. And, and I think the whole demystifying of it is what really was a big thing for me when I took this course. And I sort of find myself very careful about who I talk to about it, because I think people really have a preconceived notion that it's, it's really kind of airy-fairy, and, you know, you say you're going to go meditate, and they kind of look at you funny, like, wow, it must be nice to have that kind of time, yeah. you know. Um, Communing with the bird. Yeah, and I think it, that part was very empowering, was to know that, you know, it's, it's, it's simple. So I feel a lot happier. I mean, for an Englishman. <laughs> well, that's quite this is, extraordinary. This is very unique. Um, Say more about that, John. Well, I don't want to give away too many secrets, but no, I think it has something to do with uh, meditation, knowing myself, knowing, being comfortable, but not, not dwelling on things, hanging on to things, uh, all of the things that 
uh, that, that you wrote about and that you've taught, that they're very helpful for living. There is a certain kind of discipline to this because if you watch carefully, you'll see that a lot of the time we are cultivating mindlessness. We're actually cultivating anger, we're cultivating anxiety, we're cultivating all sorts of mind states of impatience and irritability and sadness and, and sometimes depression because practice makes perfect. If we spend large amounts of time being angry, guess what? We get better at being angry. When I feel myself getting impatient and when I can actually sit with it and, and step over that impatience, there's a whole world of just incredible insights that, you know, I, I have access to now. And, and so when I get impatient, I just remember about that and I'm able to step back and it's brought me compassion for myself in that when we're to stay within our, our breath and when I find myself going away, as we all do many times in a sitting for me, that it's okay, that it's, it's fine that that happened, where in my life I haven't had a lot of compassion for myself and things that I, that I do. I often, when I'm teaching meditation, will use a tennis ball and just remind people that they can drop into the breath virtually at any time. So it's not just like when you're doing some kind of formal meditation practice. That's the least interesting part of meditation. The real interesting part of meditation is that your whole life becomes a meditation, that you're here for all of it, and you're able to be with it with a little less reaction, a little less judgmental, and in that way, these hidden dimensions and opportunities and options appear to us and we can navigate with much greater wisdom and, which much, and with much greater self-compassion in our own lives and deal with the full catastrophe of the stress, the pain and the illness that is inevitably going to come up because we're human and we have bodies and we're mortal and we are subject to huge forces that we really have no control over. It helped me to really look at how so much of the time I'm doing things for other people, being the nurse manager and being the caretaker and always wanting to uh, make sure everything's fine, but really not spending a lot of time and care on myself. And so the meditation really helped me to learn to focus inside and to really get a sense of peace about myself and to learn to put myself first instead of last. What I found is that when I really started to pay attention to my body and my emotions and what I was feeling, that when I was really stressed or angry or tight, those were the times I tended to eat the most and the most um, high fat, high sugar types of things. And so it helped me to really slow down and say, okay, as before I put the muffin in my mouth, I go, okay, well, what's going on? What am I feeling? Why do I feel I have to eat this muffin? I go, oh yeah, I'm really angry at this person, so this is why I'm wanting to stop this muffin. It has enabled me to lose 55 pounds over the last six months or so. Slowly something starts to grow, and it's a lot more interesting than a bicep. What's growing is the capacity for stability and calmness of mind. This is almost like foreign to us. We should be learning this in elementary school or in kindergarten, uh, that we can actually modulate and regulate our states of mind, not only uh, so that we're in some kind of awareness of our thoughts and feelings, but a lot of the times our feelings, our emotions, hijack us completely, and we just spiral out of control in one way or another. Then the gates come down, and we start to see everything through our depression, our anxiety, our tremendous fears of what might happen if, oh, I could never do that because, or what will people think of me if I'm myself? And we start to edit and censor ourselves so that we're not the fullness of who we are. We leave ourselves at home, so to speak. If you see life as the meditation practice, then every moment becomes a new opportunity for you to be present. But there is an element of discipline because guess what? One moment you think, oh yeah, great idea. I saw this television show, I'll be mindful now. For the rest of my life, I'm just gonna be mindful with my children, with my parents, with myself, with my body, with my colleagues at work, with nature. Yeah, sure. 
uh, one minute you have that intention, the next moment, bingo, you're off on some trip or other. That's not a problem. The question is, can you notice that the mind went off? The mind goes off, you bring it back. That's the discipline. If you can do it once, you're there. You're here, this moment, just as it is. That is the core of the meditative traditions, the discipline and everything else. Are you willing to actually notice what's going on in your mind, that it waves just like the ocean? It comes, it goes, it's here, it's there. Virtually everything at some point or other goes through your mind and carries you off. Can you come back to an awareness of the breath of your body, of what's on your mind, so that you know the mind goes off, you bring it back. The mind goes off, you bring it back. The mind goes off, you bring it back. The mind goes off, I don't want to bring it back. This, I'm getting sick and tired of this. This is really boring. Guess what? You bring it back anyway, just for fun, just to see what would happen if you brought it back anyway. It's like working with a, a, a weight. You know, if you want this muscle to grow, you work against resistance. You let the weight go out, then you bring it back. You let the weight go out, you bring it back. It feels a little heavier the second time. You let the weight go out, you bring it back. I don't want to bring it back. My muscle's starting to hurt. This is boring anyway. Show me something else. Now the body scan that we practice and teach people in the stress reduction clinic is the first formal meditation practice that we teach because even if you have a chronic pain condition or can't uh, sit up, most people can lie down and if not on the floor, then in bed. And if you're lying on the floor, of course, one should have a, a good you know, pad cushioning for yourself. And then from here, we would actually visit, say, the toes of the left foot. And then over time, through the body scan, we would allow the field of awareness to include the bottom of the foot and the heel and the top of the foot. As you bring your awareness uh, into the region of the lower legs, the shins and the calves, and attending to and experiencing whatever sensations are here in this region of the body, both at the level of your skin and also deep, right down into the, the bones. So that we're actually cultivating familiarity now with the knees. We're letting our awareness fill the entire lower region of the torso from the belly to the lower back, and just breathing with the whole of it. We talk about the digestive fires, fire in the belly, or having a gut feeling. So just attending to the whole metaphorical and poetic dimension of this region of our body, the very kind of root of our emotional balance and well-being the rib cage moving, and a sense of this region as kind of the region of the metaphorical heart as well, where so often we have feelings of lightheartedness or open-heartedness, or, or sometimes hard-heartedness or broken-heartedness. And the throat is an interesting place to reside for a moment or two. In part because it's what allows us to uh, give voice to the heart, to the soul of who we are, to find perhaps our own voice, to speak, and to speak truly. and moving into the region of the eyes, the eyebrows, the eyelids, and the forehead, the space between the eyebrows, and just sensing the whole of the, the head breathing.
Like I find at work, if, if there's a stressful moment, I'll feel like, a, and I didn't realize this before I started doing the mindfulness program, a band around my gut, like around my stomach. And it's an opportunity for me to say, oh, okay, what's that about? And then just breathe into it and it just, and, and actually have my belly then move in and out. It's given me a skill that's allowed me now to, to locate uh, points in my body that are tense uh, when, there's, when there's either an inner stressor or an outer stressor. And I would say 75% of the time, which is, which is fairly good for, for me, because I was like uh, 0% before I learned this stuff, you know, 75% of the time, I can let go of it, and it actually dissipates. So that's a good feeling if you're in front of, I, I'm a teacher, so if you're in front of a room full of people, and you all of a sudden become aware that every muscle in your upper back is, you know, tensed, and uh, that distraction can really, uh, can inhibit your performance. Uh, so it's, it's proved helpful. So one of the hardest things for our patients to actually realize, but they do it fairly quickly because of the way we teach the body scan and sitting meditation and so forth, is that uh, we're not trying to wall off their pain if they're in pain. We're actually laying out the welcome mat for it, the red carpet, and saying, listen, if it's going to come up, whether it's a headache or pain in the lower back or in the neck or on movement or whatever, let's simply let it be here. Put the welcome mat out for it and learn how to let's say, breathe with it, okay? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the pain will go away. In fact, sometimes the pain will get more intense in the sense of the sensations. The beauty of the Hatha Yoga is it's just another form of meditation and it introduces different ways of holding the body and you put movement into it, uh, very much so, but at the same time it's all just moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness, just as the sitting meditation would be or the body scan. What you do is not as important as your sincerity of effort. And so as I say, move my arm like this, and I'm not moving it in any particular way, I'm just moving my arm, but I'm moving it with awareness. And I feel almost as if I'm caressing the air, or the air, as if it were water, was streaming through my fingers and around the whole of my arm. Now when you're ready, uh, let's uh, bend the knees so that the feet are flat on the floor. Let's raise the arms slowly back up over the head so that they're uh, on the floor beyond the head. On an out breath, slowly moving the arms towards the knees as you sit up as far as you can. And just let the hands come up towards or over the knees. And then at your own pace, uh, kelp-like, almost like a, a bed of kelp waving in the ocean, just going back and forth. And indeed the body just loves to be worked with in this way and it responds. And let the waves of the breath help with the carrying, with the flowing. So you're sitting up on the out-breaths and then on the in-breaths, arching way back and stretching right through every region from the pelvis right up through the fingertips. And breathing, letting the breath move deeply in and out as you do this. Let's uh, bend uh, the left knee and put the left foot on the floor. And then take the right foot and cross it over the uh, left leg right above the knee. So it's like crossing your leg at the ankle. Only reaching whatever your limit is, not yanking or pulling or forcing. And then when you're ready, stop the rocking and seeing if you can raise your forehead up towards the uh, right lower leg. And, and then you can begin rocking again in this position. And this can be tremendously valuable for people who have lower back 
problems. Just breathing with the sensations that arise moment by moment. I've always done yoga, so I thought, oh, well, this is easy. I'll, I'll be able to handle this. But I hadn't done yoga in a mindful way. I had done yoga physically as part of a body program. So to incorporate it as, as a mindful practice um, is exhilarating. I love to do yoga that way. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis 15 years ago. Uh, I have a very slow progressive form. So every year I th feel like I lose a little bit more strength. It's particularly in my legs and walking and balance and things like that. Uh, so now I'm uh, using a, a cane, which was something I was very reluctant to do before. I see our work as part of a new field in medicine, which is now being called mind-body medicine. And there's a great deal of science that suggests that there are very, very real pathways through which the, mm, our thoughts and feelings can actually influence our biology. In fact, our thoughts and feelings are part of our biology. They're just not very well understood. But certainly emotions now are understood to influence health, both short-term and long-term. Specifically, research that's been done by people like John Kabat-Zinn suggests that the, you, there is an alteration in the autonomic nervous system, heart rate, um, breathing rate, body temperature, a level of stimulation or level of attention that goes on when one is overexcited or anxious. And that heightened level of response tends to heighten your awareness of pain and that when you use stress reduction techniques, you not only alter those physical responses, you alter the pain threshold so that a typical stimulus, for example, a hot, um, temp a hot pad that one might touch your finger on is better tolerated, a higher temperature before one has to withdraw the contact with stress reduction techniques as compared to without stress reduction techniques. Oh, I, I've been able to catch migraines right at the beginning. I was sitting in my office and, and just sitting, I'd, oh, I feel something here. So I'd, I'd sit there and I'd go, I'd focus on it. I'd just shut my eyes and focus on it, just relax. And I might say about 75% of the time that I was able to dissipate the, uh, the migraine right at the beginning. One of the major issues in headache is that it seems to be a trigger problem. In other words, anybody in the world can get a headache, but the threshold for triggering it is different from one individual to another. And the threshold in people with migraine, for example, is a lot lower than for people who don't experience headaches very often. That threshold or that trigger is set off by lots of different things. And some of the things that typically set people off are anxiety or stress related to their work or their home life. Um, oftentimes deadlines, sometimes even good occasions like going to a wedding. And many people have what we call letdown headaches where they'll have the exciting or stressful event and on the weekend or the day after they have their headaches. The challenge is uh, to utilize these very powerful methods uh, for paying attention to actually drop in on and into your own life and your own body. And then the world becomes your teacher. The universe collaborates with you in that so that everything you need to deal with or know will in some way be presented to you. And then the stress, rather than being your enemy, or just some big pain that you gotta deal with, becomes a new opportunity for you to grow the boundaries and edges of your life and of your being and of your health and of your relationships. And that becomes one hell of an adventure. And then everything is interesting, even the hard times, even the dark times, even the times when you feel completely out of control and everything is going to, you know, to pieces. We were interested in asking the question, can we find a system that we can study that might answer the question, can the mind actually influence a healing process that we can see and photograph 
that we don't have to use a lot of high-tech equipment to look inwardly and then there'd be some question, is this healing or is this not? So we chose the skin disease psoriasis, which you can photograph, which uh, is, um, involves um, eruptions of the epidermis, very rapidly growing cells in the epidermis who lose their cellular control and just uh, create rough, scaly patches, all, can be all over the body. Nobody really understands in detail how that disease works, but it's very clear that emotional reactivity, high levels of emotional stress can produce flare-ups and huge exacerbations. The treatment, there is no cure for psoriasis, but the treatment for it is sunlight, ultraviolet light. And the ultraviolet light tends to knock out the rapidly growing cells in the epidermis so that they slow down their growth. And you can actually photograph over time the skin clearing. So what we decided to do is, in collaboration with our dermatology colleagues at UMass, was to randomize people between two conditions. One, they just get the light treatment by itself. The other, while they're getting the light treatment, made a guided meditation tape so that they're practicing mindfulness standing there in the light box. Of course, if I were a patient, I would uh, be without my clothes on, and, and, and I'm going to shield my eyes, the corneas, from the ultraviolet, and then close the door. As the lights come on, focusing on your breathing and feeling it as it flows in and out. And as you do, breathing in a sense of relaxation and warmth and well-being and imagining that you're breathing out any tension and worries, impatience and fatigue that you may be feeling. So it's a perfect environment in which to learn standing meditation. And uh, then we threw in as well in the later segment of the treatment that people would visualize that the ultraviolet light is actually knocking out the rapidly growing cells in the epidermis. So they're participating in intending the light to do its work and heal the skin. So what we do is then follow uh, their progress over 12 weeks and chart, plot, how much their skin is clearing. What we found was that the meditators heal at about four times the rate of the non-meditators when you do the statistics. Something that they are doing inside that light box is influencing a healing process that's got to be down, right down at the genetic and molecular level that is uh, reducing this uncontrolled cell proliferation and healing the skin. That's not curing the skin because they can flare up again, but healing the skin. Now, uh, there are some interesting things about this study. One is it's a built-in cost-effectiveness study because if people meditating while they're in the light box need fewer treatments, then uh, it will cost less. It's also influencing uncontrolled cell proliferation, a process which is very similar to cancer. And some of the genes that are involved in psoriasis seem to also be involved in basal cell carcinoma. So it suggests that something that the mind does might actually be able to influence processes that might have an influence on cancer. People very often ask me, well, what is on this tape that people were able to heal at four times the rate of the regular medical treatment itself, which is a powerful treatment, it's ultraviolet light. And what I like to say is, well, a lot of what's on the tape is silence. And then the rest of what's on the tape is how to work with the silence. In our encounter with our patients who are sent by their doctors in the stress reduction program, we see them, we see everything that we do with them as standing in that domain of the sacred. I like to think of it, if you will, uh, 
in the language of the Native Americans. You know, the Navajo like to say, may you walk in beauty. I see our patients as walking in beauty. Or to switch, I see them as like Homeric heroes and heroines. They're on a hero's journey, a life trajectory, uh, during which they have met with all sorts of uh, challenges and stresses and uh, mm, ill winds and ill-fated situations through which they have persevered. So they are truly heroic. And our real challenge is to draw out of them what is deepest and best and most beautiful in them already. So it's not putting anything into them. And that's in fact what the word education really means. Educare means to draw forth. It's not stuffing people with more information. It's actually eliciting the native creativity, wisdom, capacity that we have which is grounded in attention, which is grounded in our capacity for wakefulness. We were approached by people who were part of the Massachusetts Committee on Criminal Justice to see about bringing mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, into the prisons, both for the inmates and for the staff, because as you might imagine, Prison is one of the most stressful places on earth, both to work and to be incarcerated. There was a lot of emotion right beneath the surface, and what happened when we actually practiced with our eyes closed, which is, again, in prison, the first rule is never close your eyes, and there was enough trust built up in this room that we were able to close our eyes, and I was able to sit with these men without any guards in the room or anything like that and uh, everybody felt safe including me and it felt like giving food to starving people we we're starving for some kind of ex authentic experience of education and here's an experience of education that has to do most deeply with the fundamentals of who I am as a person So the general sense was that people were learning and growing and changing in exactly the kind of way that you want people to change when your objective is rehabilitation and getting people back into society so that they don't immediately commit crimes and go back into prison. So I would say that the course taught me how to be still and to find my breath again. And, to, and in finding that, um, I found a, just a trust that has just been the most amazing thing for me. A trust in um, uh, my body's ability to heal and a trust in my own ability to just be with anything. I think facing up to all those myriad of fears that I have, fears of people getting sick, fears of more people dying, fears of getting older, fears of being menopausal, fears of uh, not getting along with stepchildren, fears of parents aging, there was just a, a, a myriad of things that, that were scaring the daylights out of me. So now I'm more acquainted with fear. I can, I can look at it and say, oh yeah, here we go. This, is, this looks like I'm worried that someone's gonna get sick and someone's gonna die. I'm involved with a number of people with terminal illnesses, just personal friends. And uh, I can just acknowledge the fears there. So instead of being addicted, which we virtually all are to the news and to television and to constantly hearing something you know, on the radio so that we don't feel alone or having to be on our cell phones, maybe we could learn to drop a little bit more into 
the stillness of our being, even as we're driving around or doing what we have to do, walking to the Xerox machine or whatever it is, that we could learn how to be more embodied and simplify our lives a little bit, live with a little bit more peacefulness and wakefulness. The next to the last line of Walden is, only that day dawns to which we are awake. That is the message of mindfulness. Either we live our lives while we have them to live, or basically we sleepwalk through our lives and, as he said, wake up at the end, perhaps, and realize that uh, we missed the whole show. And we can always find other people or this thing or that thing to blame for why our lives didn't work out well. But the real challenge is to work with what we have to work with and start where we are. Thank you.